Selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... As easy as pie? Sure. All you have to do is enter your license plate or VIN. As easy as a stroll in the park. Okay. Then just answer a few questions and you'll get a real offer in seconds. As easy as singing. Why not? Schedule a pickup or drop-off and Carvana will pay you that amount right on the spot. As easy as playing guitar. Actually, I find that kind of difficult. But selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... Can be. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get an instant offer today. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Kimberly Wafling about the biggest obstacles to success in today's organizations. Kimberly Weefling, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, John. Great to be here with you. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about the biggest obstacles to success in today's organizations and what we can do about it. Uh, as we get started, I wanted to share Kimberly's bio with everybody. Kimberly Weefling is known for her authenticity and, scr- and scrappy style. At Hewlett Packer, she felt like a hired assassin where she prioritized projects over people after 10 years working in technology. She realized that technology fails far less frequently than people do. She uses her expertise as a scientist and technologist to navigate and transform the messy world of organizational culture. Her superpower is helping companies achieve what seems impossible by converting common sense into common practice and bringing people with diverse backgrounds together to achieve what couldn't be done alone. Kimberly has worked with over 100 major corporations, including Yamaha Motors, Suntory, Mitsubishi, NASA, and Indeed, among many others. Kimberly, it's a pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the conversation? Yeah, I was really lucky because I got to study physics, which helped me understand really complex things are not necessarily complicated. And I really feel fortunate that I started off my life wanting to be a scientist and then switching over to be this person working in organizations. And and I also want to mention, none of the changes that I help make happen, happen because of me. They all happen because of the people who get caught on fire by the concepts that we address together and decide to do something positive about it. Yeah, well said. I, I think it's really, really important for us to look at complex systems as we try to address the most pressing organizational community and social challenges we face in the world. And as complex and messy as they are, it also isn't always super complicated. And I, I know we tend to lump those together, but so often the the, the biggest answers to the most pressing complicated problems uh, require just clear-eyed awareness of the complexity, but then sim- simple, straightforward, consistent effort on core areas over time. And when we can do that, that can make a huge, huge difference. It may not completely solve the problem or eradicate the problem, but it can make a huge, huge difference. So this is what we'll be discussing today. I really appreciate your background and everything that you're going to bring to the conversation. So let's frame out first, like some of those big, huge obstacles. What do you see uh, that organizations are really facing 
the most today and, and perhaps juxtapose that to what we may have seen a generation ago or even a decade ago? Well, I'm a scientist, you know, so I've got to go to the data. So one of my favorite studies was published by Sloan Business Management about what are the top causes of failure in global teams. And I can imagine that you'd probably guess the number one cause of failure is they failed to build trusting relationships. And uh, number two was communication. And when I looked further at the data, I realized it wasn't all about language and culture. It was they could not make decisions and solve problems together. And then three and four were goals were not clear, shared and aligned. And when I looked at all that, I said, Holy cow, whose job is it to make sure that goals are clear, shared, aligned, that people can communicate, solve problems, make decisions, and have healthy, trusting relationships? It's totally a failure of leadership, and I don't think that has changed much over the centuries. (laughs) Yeah, I agree with you there. I I think some of the the, uh, consistent problems we see in leadership have always been problems in leadership. One thing that we've definitely seen shift uh, let's just t- say over the last 50 years uh, in the world of work is we, we've seen huge shifts in the types of work, in the types of organizations, how those organizations are structured. So that also may change the way that leaders manage or lead. Um, and so I, I say that not because I think, let's take, for example, a factory setting 50 years ago. Um, more hierarchical, top-down, power control, authoritarian kind of leadership style. Now, was that the best style back then? I would argue no, uh, and and that could be a, a fun debate. But that's predominantly what we saw, right? And we saw that throughout many, many organizations, really for generations. And then slowly that started to change. And now today we see more flattened organizations. Uh, we see more shared governance, collaborative approaches. Uh, we, we see more servant leadership. We see more empowering kind of approaches to leadership. Um, but there's still those that use the old command control kind of an approach and believe strongly in it. And they like to use fear as a motivator. Uh, those people still exist. But the nature of the common organization where most people work is you know, fundamentally different than how most people work, say, you know, generations ago. Uh, And so that has pushed people to get out of their comfort zone and to try to lean into different models and modes of leadership, which I think has been a healthy change, as resistant as as we may have been. So then the question is, again, could we have been more effective in the past if we would have gotten away from those command control kind of approaches? Uh, Personally, I think so, because even today we see in, in more manual labor or factory type settings, We see plenty of examples of much more empowering types of workplaces that value people and their input uh, than we saw, say, 50 plus years ago. Um, So anyways, uh, with that kind of laid out as a as additional context, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Well, I think that things have changed, of course, over the years, even in a factory setting. I took a tour of a Toyota factory that was here in the San Francisco Bay Area for a number of years. And somebody told me the story as I was taking the tour that the president came down to the factory floor and said, hey, uh, if I don't come in to work tomorrow, how many cars are you going to make here? And they said, well, same number. And he said, well, if you don't come in, how many cars? Oh, yeah, that'll be a problem. To try to point out that maybe the president isn't the most important to the productivity of the production line. Now, that does ignore the fact that Dr. Robert Sutton at Stanford University published a book uh, clearly discussing the concept of power poisoning. And so what you said about the structure of the organization, if you have a structure that concentrates power at the so-called top of the organization, you're going to get this power poisoning where uh, these people at the top, they get more positive feedback. Surprise, surprise. They have lower impulse control. They think of their own needs more than others. And these are people who are responsible for other people. They have less empathy and they think the rules don't apply to them. And Bob Sutton asked the question, do we just promote these kind of jerks or does power change people? And you know the answer to that one. Well, it's both, actually. I mean, we do. Power changes people and then they get caught in a bubble 
and you, they get surrounded by sycophants who are telling them yes. what they want to hear. So that perpetuates the problem. But in some organizations, my goodness, they some organizations just really have a knack for promoting those types of people. And especially if, if in top leadership in the C-suite, those types of people exist, then they tend to promote people who are like them. Uh, anyways, it's a, it's a big problem. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't help, as you were describing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can think of several right off the top of my head that I've had close encounters with. And I'm just like, they just don't get it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, that I, I, I believe they're good people. I believe they're doing the best they know how they don't get it. And they don't understand how much they are um, undermining their own ability to lead effectively. Yes. As a matter of fact, I blame the people for not having the courage to speak, speak truth to power. Uh, one model of an organization like that is imagine a bunch of monkeys in a tree and you're the top monkey looking down. You see a bunch of smiling faces and you're the bottom monkey looking up. Yeah, you know what you see. And uh, if we don't... <laughs> And and I mean, I'm a consultant, so I always feel like it's my responsibility to bring the bad news and to take the point of the spear and, and, and take the risk that I wouldn't want to take if I were an employee and had a mortgage, a spouse that didn't work, a kid in college. And so I'm often in the position of sharing with these kinds of executives the honest truth of what their people would like to say to them, but won't because they're afraid. And uh, when I tell them that... When I say, hey, here's some feedback that your people have, you want to hear it. Oh, yeah, Kimberly. And here's some things that they think are working, not working, missing, and that if you changed would really help improve the organization and achieve the results that you yourself want. You know what the first question they ask me, John? When I say something negative? What's that? Who said that? (laughs) They always want to try to figure it out. Um, It's so funny. And it just speaks to the insecurity. Now I, I was working with an organization a few years back and they did one of these big engagement culture surveys. Right. And they, they got hammered. Like they, 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 they do these every year and they saw like a, a double digit percentage decline from one year to the next across trust variables and a whole variety of things. Right. Uh, and then there were comments and in the comments, there were some pretty darn pointed comments And you know what they did? The very first thing they said was, well, we need to figure out who said this. And they claimed that even though it was anonymous, they claimed that they needed to figure it out because they needed to talk to those people to figure out how to make it better or to fix it. And I called bull crap on that. (laughs) But so what they what I found out that they were doing, um, because this was an internal uh, uh, internal survey where it was technically anonymous, no names but they did track IP addresses. And so they were going back after the fact and trying to figure out who may have responded based on IP address. And I just couldn't believe it. I mean, they're dealing with trust issues and now they're like hunting people down. It it blew my mind. Yet these types of things happen again and again and again. And it just, again, it speaks, it speaks to the insecurity of leaders who can't accept bad feedback when that's kind of their reaction. Yeah. Well, honestly, whenever I, go into an organization and I do personal interviews, I promise anonymity, of course, when they have these written interviews, like you're referring to people do call me and say, Kimberly, is it really anonymous? Do you think it's really anonymous? Because they don't trust the organization enough to even answer honestly. And if you do surveys and you don't take positive action, you only make everything worse. Well, that's absolutely oh that's God. absolutely true, and we see that all the time too. Again, not necessarily due to malice on the part of the organization. Um, I, I've seen well-meaning organizations. It's just the cycle of rolling out the survey and having people do it, and then do the analysis, and then they have all these meetings, and they they may feel like they are being proactive, but the average employee doesn't see any of that. All all they know is six months has gone by and nothing has happened. Or maybe a year has gone by and nothing has happened. And so we have to be much quicker to respond and help our people recognize and understand how their feedback has informed our decision making. Yeah, I'm actually uh, lucky enough to have had, oh, many lunches with Dr. Edgar Schein. He's my role model. He's my mentor. I hope he's still alive. He was in his 90s last time I saw him before COVID. 
And we would, I paid him to have lunch with me for two hours every month for years. And uh, he said, you should better not just do a survey at all if you're not going to take any action. And he also famously said, the only thing that leaders do of any importance in an organization is to create and manage the culture. And what kind of culture are we creating when we create that kind of experience for people? And Hunting down IP addresses, it's outrageous, John. I've never heard of that one. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, that, it's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, so you, you've identified some core things. I mean, the, the foundational elements of trust and, and communication, the ability for us to just hold each other mutually accountable and trust each other as we're going through the messiness of the work life and trying to solve and tackle problems. If we can't, if we don't have that, it's going to be hard to do anything else well, and then what you end up having is just people watching their backs. So people spend most of their time and energy watching their backs, making sure that they don't stick out um, so they don't get their heads chopped off. And instead of being innovative and productive and like solving problems, we're just, it's just status quo, just doing the bare minimum to get by without, you know, ruffling feathers. Well, that's what they say in the famous saying, was it in Japan? The nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Uh, definitely. And in the times of a uh, challenge of COVID, for example, right now in the U.S., I've heard that over half of employees have some kind of emotional or mental challenges that they're facing. And 10 or 20 percent are really in need of some kind of medical care. And big, strong professionals do not want to go into their managers and tell them I'm feeling lonely. I'm depressed. I'm isolated. I'm struggling. I'm stressed out. And they need to have some help. And at least finally, HR departments are starting to say, hmm, I guess mental health is not just a personal issue. Now it's a strategic imperative. This is going to threaten the ability of our company to function if we don't create a more healthy work environment for our people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we know the problems. We've been talking about some of those bad examples, right? But what what do the most successful leaders do? What have you seen in your practice as you work with executives and various organizations in your consulting work? Uh, what are the most effective, successful leaders doing in their organizations to overcome those types of perpetual challenges that we were talking about? Well, I hate to say it, but it's been known for 30 years what we need to do. <laughs> like if you look at the Gallup research on employee engagement for the past 30 years, there's 12 things you need to have your people say yes to. Look it up out there, people. It's not rocket science and it's not a big secret. And they need to be able to answer yes to questions like, do I know what's expected of me at work? And do I have the tools and equipment to do my job? Now, only and can I just can I just say how low of a bar is that? Right, <laughs> it's pretty low. <laughs> yeah, that's that, right. that should I, be a given. Like you should oh. never walk into the the office without knowing what you need to do and if you have the equipment to be able to do it. I, I mean, it's absurd that people so yeah. often don't even know those basic things. Well, let me tell you, the last time I checked, forty one percent of American workers said. Yes, to those two questions. 41%, like 59% don't know what's expected and don't have the tools of equipment to do their job. You're right. It's pretty much like not having oxygen to breathe. Uh, and the other 12 questions are no more stunning than that. And then there's the Leadership Challenge, the work out of Santa Clara University that's been published for, again, 30 years about the five practices of the best leaders, not managers. There's a difference the best leaders in the world. And there's six behaviors in each of the five practices. And the least of the five practice behaviors is encourage the heart to actually reward, recognize, appreciate, celebrate people. And the least of the 30 behaviors is ask for feedback about how my leadership impacts you. What's up with that? People don't want to know. So yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I, th I think you're right. It, it isn't rocket science. Like these things have been known for a long time. The best organizations try to integrate these into their systems, their 
processes, their practices, so that it's just embedded into the organization and the fabric of what makes the organization tick. It's not enough to just mention these things in meetings or when you have the big rah-rah sessions. You know, is language important? Yes. When you're getting together with people in meetings, do you want to say these things? Yes. But if that's all you're doing, then you're not really doing anything meaningful or sustainable. So we have to find ways to integrate it, to embed it into the systems of the organization. When we do that, and again, it's not rocket science, like these very simple things, like helping people to know what their job is and how to do it and that they have the equipment necessary to do it. I mean, I, years ago, I worked in a factory. I can't even fathom like showing up to work and factory work where I worked, it was not complicated, but like, what if I show up and they're like, well, we need to create this thing, but we're not going to tell you how to do it. We're not going to give you the tools or equipment to do it. Uh, just go figure it out. That's crazy, right? <laughs> nobody, nobody would expect that. Um, right. Yet for some reason, and I know we're in a knowledge economy and the, you know, so many jobs aren't manual labor or factory work or hands-on type of work, but still, even though there's messiness, complexity, and ambiguity in the work that we do, can we have more clarity? The answer is yes, we absolutely can. Well, everybody needs to be able to look up and see that North Star. Hey, where are we going? And what's our purpose beyond profit? What's our mission that matters? And be able to navigate on their own without having somebody micromanage every step of the way. And they need to be able to be told when they're doing something that's working, when it's something that you want to see them do again. If you don't tell people what's working, they might stop doing it. Unfortunately, this thing about not encouraging people, giving them recognition and appreciation and rewards and celebrating what's working. This is pretty pathetic. And it's like, oh, yeah, we pay you. You know, you get your reward in your paycheck. I'm sorry. Whenever your manager comes to you and says, hey, Kimberly, come into my office later this afternoon. I want to give you some feedback. You're not expecting positive because it's so prevalent that you only hear when something's not working. And when they want you to change because you're not meeting their expectations. Why can't we tell people what's working and celebrate and even celebrate necessary risks that people need to take? If you want to be an innovator, you need to take risks. You need to learn from mistakes. You need to fail forward. You need to prototype. When I first started traveling to Japan, they said, we want you to teach us to be innovative, Kimberly. And I said, great. Uh, When's the last time you celebrated a failure? Oh, Oh, we do not do such things. Oh, really? Well, guess what? In my workshop, you're going to make at least three mistakes a day or you're going to fail this workshop. Hey, totally their brains shorted out. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> fail forward, fall, uh, fall fast, fail forward, iterate. Uh, and, you know, j- the failure, quote unquote failure, that's just part of the scientific method, right? Like we, we learn, we hypothesize, we try something, it works or it doesn't work, then we adjust and we move forward in a more clear fashion. So that's what we've been doing for forever as we try to apply the scientific method. Why are we so afraid of that as we work within organizations or as we lead? It it, it blows my mind. Well, you know, it's no fun to fail. I don't like it. It's embarrassing. It hurts. I've suffered through some pretty big failures in my life. And hey, I live in the Silicon Valley. We build success on a heap of a failure graveyard. You go down to the Facebook campus. And last time I checked, the back of the Facebook sign still said Sun Microsystems. (laughs) Yeah. Well, good. So as we're wrapping things up today, Mm -hmm. I thought maybe we could just spend the last few minutes talking a little bit about what each of us individually can do. So you know, maybe I'm in a leadership position or an executive position. I have the opportunity to influence those around me, or maybe I'm just new, you know, early or mid career. Maybe I don't have, you know, leadership or management experience or responsibilities, but how can I lean into leadership and develop that capacity within myself? Well, first of all, I think the organizational structure, as you pointed out earlier, is the biggest problem we're facing. If you create hierarchy and command and control and concentrate power at the top, you are prone to power poisoning, and it's just all bad from there. Now, from you can lead from any chair in the organization by your behavior. So what you do is you go in, you build relationships, you build trust, you make sure that you hammer out working together agreements with your colleagues. You make sure that people have methods and approaches to solve problems together, to make decisions together. You're open, you're transparent. Hey, and like the CEO of Box down the street from where I live, I walk through taking a tour of Box. 
And I look at the one desk, it looks like every other desk, and that's the CEO and founder's desk. Try to remove those trappings of power whenever possible. Because even if you say, yeah, our organization is all flat and we don't go for this hierarchy stuff, people still know you're the founder. They still know you're the CEO. So you've got to somehow make yourself approachable. And you've got to make truly safe ways to get honest feedback from your people, not tracing their IP addresses for crying out loud. There's got to be some suggestion boxes or anonymous way to ask questions and offer feedback. Because you at the top, you're starving for honest feedback. I guarantee you, one CEO said, the day I got promoted was the last day anybody told me the truth except for my spouse. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. So be so be that person. Have, have the guts, have the courage to speak up and to speak out if and when you notice things. It, that may be a good idea that you have that goes against the status quo. You may observe a challenge or a problem and you have some sort of a response or an answer to it. Sometimes it's pointing out problematic behaviors uh, of other people um, or even those in the leadership or executive team. Just be willing to speak up. That's leadership. That That is yeah. truly courageous leadership uh, and we need more of it. And one of the CEOs that I work with, she has 900 people on her team. She starts every one of our sessions with a moment of vulnerability where she talks about a mistake she made, a failure she had, something she needs help with to make herself human and approachable. It doesn't change the fact that she's got that position and title, which creates its own problems. It does help people feel like they can come to her and openly and honestly take a risk. Yeah, yeah. Well said, Kimberly. It has been a pleasure. I note the time and I need to let you go here in just a minute. But before we wrap up, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you and find out more about your work. And then give us the final word on the topic for today. All right. So I wrote Scrappy Project Management years ago, which I didn't realize was really about project leadership. Check that out on Amazon. Inspired Organizational Cultures is a workbook that you can use to work your way through a healthy organizational culture, a whole bunch of other books out there, KimberlyWeefling.com or Weefling.com are my websites. Or if you can't find me, just call the police. They'll know where I am. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding about that. Uh, my final word on the topic is if you are a person with, oh, you really need your job. And if you lose it, you're screwed. It's real hard to be a great leader. Uh, there's a difference between leadership and management. Lead people, manage stuff. Lead people, manage cows. Nobody wants to be managed. And people willingly follow the kind of leaders that model the way, inspire shared vision, challenge the process, encourage the heart, and enable others to be successful. That's all in the leadership challenge. I didn't make this stuff up. It's based on 30 years of research of what really works. Do what works. It's a recipe for success. A recipe doesn't make cookies. But if you're not a great chef, you start with a recipe and you can cook like a great chef. Yeah, well said. Thank you, Kimberly. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Kimberly can do for you. Check out the books. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.